。各位同心，大家安安，大家好。今日咱的宜兰州的同心有来啊无？请恁举一个旗啊，给大家看一个，大家该欢迎。台北的同心有来啊无？举旗啊，给大家看一个。新店的同心有来啊无？也一个机要大家看下。台中州的同心有来啊无？也一个机要大家看下。台南的同心有来啊无？来自最远的高雄州的同心舞来啊不？非常的欢迎各位。咱今日有两个来自国外的好朋友，一个是 Mr. n e a k a 阿哥，一个是来自美国司法单位 ，Mr. Scotch Black。On behalf of Taiwan Civil Government, Julian and I would like to welcome you all to the conference on Taiwan's legal status. 台湾民政府自从两千零六年以来，对台湾国际地位的追求非常的拍拼。咱大家同心，应该有感受得到。咱大家家己来鼓励咱大家，好唔好<笑> ？We are honored to have Mr. n e a k a n And Mr. Scott Brock here as our guest speaker. 咱今日有两个来自美国的非常可贵的贵宾，尼尔卡加这个 Scott Brock， 这两个来自美国。尤其是这个尼尔卡，是咱台湾民政府的好朋友，含咱来往已经六年啊。伊在美国。是一个真有名，而且职业二十八年的这个律师楼的工课，是华盛顿 DC 上界大的律师楼。伊的专长是会当来帮忙咱台湾，是咪咱的中心，你的公司伫美国就市，所以这边来，含咱台湾民众所有嘅中心，大家来见面，含咱所有嘅中心。但来探讨，要来让咱台湾的经济变得更加好。另外，迄位是大家拢已经伫网络上有看到，伊是 Mr. Scotch Brock， 伊是非常的了不起，伊是拜托美国的总统提名，经过参议院、众议院的通过，来任职最高。检察署的副检察总长，而且嘛有经过，而且伊嘛是经过美国总统提名，和美国的参众议员来通过，而且任期五年的时间才过，所以这边伊会当来甲咱讲几句话话，哎嘛准备较袂歹，啊所以咱搁再一摆。来甲伊邀请，即个叫做尼尔卡加 Mr. Scott Brock 两个招待。
来拜托这个，你要卡来介绍 Stuck Brock， 因为美国人介绍美国人较简单。<笑>咱将这个重大任务来交给 OK， 你啊 ，Please。I'd like to begin by thanking Roger and TCG for their kind invitation to Scott and I, and for all their efforts in organising this uh, today's event. We're very grateful for your efforts and, and the hard work that's gone into making this event possible. This is my first visit to Taiwan, and I must say I, that I'm, I've had the opportunity to experience, experience the great warmth of the people of this wonderful country. It's a country of great culture, innovation, and beauty. We are here today to celebrate with you your efforts for a greater understanding of the history and ties between the U.S. and Taiwan, with a particular focus on the history of the legal and political ties between the two countries. As you know, I'm a citizen of both Great Britain and the U.S., two great countries with long histories and ta historic ties that share, in addition to a common language, strong beliefs in the importance of individual rights and systems of government that protect and foster such rights as they have evolved over time. As you know, America fought a long and costly war to secure its independence from Great Britain. So I fully understand the importance of securing and protecting individual rights and the democratic system of government in which such rights are able to flourish and evolve. The issue that triggered the American Revolution and enabled a bustling economy to become a truly independent democratic country and now a world power and sponsor and protector of democratic systems of government are the important principles of constitutionalism, separation of power, and inherent liberty that people have to determine their own destinies. It's with great pleasure today that I'm introducing to you our speaker, Scott Block. Scott, I believe, has espoused and embodied these principles while working in private practice of law and while working in the government of the United States during the Bush administration from 2001 to 2008. During his ten tenure as the Special Counsel of the United States and head of the United States Office of Special Counsel, an independent federal investigative and prosecutorial agency of the US federal government, Scott was the watchdog of activities of the executive branch of the US government that includes the president and many departments of government, including the departments of defense, transportation, justice, state, among others. As a special counsel of the U.S., Scott brought efficiency, ethics, and legality to the executive branch. He will tell you about some of the actions that he brought, but suffice it to say, he took to task special interests and powerful people in government who were at the very top of the administration. Through his oversight of aviation safety, illegal political activity in the federal government, and service member rights, Scott brought to bring sought to bring integrity and transparency to government so that it could function for the benefit of all American people, not just those in power. Scott is now in the private practice of law in Washington, D.C., where he specialize in, specializes in issues of integrity in government con contracting, complex litigation, service member uh, and contractor rights, and class actions involving matters of public interest, and thereby continues to advocate for and seek to protect the rights of the individual. He has taught at law schools and speaks of law and public service. Uh, he has appeared in the national media, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Washington Times, New York Times, Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, NPR, CNN, and NBC, and on international media on CCTV, Art TV, and Polish public television on issues relating to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the legal aspects of the new US health, uh, health law called Obamacare. Scott and I have, uh, have co-counseled on a few matters over the last few years, and I would say that he's one of the most effective, erudite, and insightful lawyers that I have had the opportunity uh, to work with during my career. 
It's also a true privilege to be able to call him a, a friend. In addition to being an accomplished lawyer, uh, Scott is the author of, of a, a book called, entitled uh, The Essential Bell, A Prophet for Our Times, a collection of writings and sayings of Hilaire Belloc, a famous Anglo-French historian and statesman and one of the most prolific and highly regarded authors, poets, and essayists of the early 20th century. It's interesting to note that following Belloc's death in 1953, Monsignor Ronald Knox observed of Hilaire Belloc, Belloc, no man of his time fought so hard for the good things I believe that this is to be a, a guiding principle for my colleague, Scott Block. I would like to introduce to you the Honorable Scott J. Block, esteemed lawyer, academic, and author, who will speak to you today on Taiwan civil government, a political purgatory. Thank you. Well, thank you, Neil, for that gracious introduction. Can you all hear me? Ni hao. I've also had the privilege of working with Neil on a number of matters, including Taiwan civil government. He is a great attorney and a great American, even if he does originally hail from England. I also wish to thank our hosts especially Roger Lin and the delegation of Taiwan civil government for their warm hospitality and kindness in making all of the arrangements for this important event to examine the ties between our countries and your efforts for autonomous government. I am deeply impressed by the indomitable spirit of your people and your great strides as an economic powerhouse in the world today. Your voice needs to be heard. I would like to tell you a little bit more about what I did in our little experiment in autonomous government called the United States of America in Washington, D.C., to give some counterpoint to the topic of my talk today in order to better understand the tensions that exist in the political and legal realms and how one man's voice, one man's voice, can give a voice to others who are trying to be heard about injustice and corruption in government. Well, hopefully the slideshow will work. Where do I point it? There? There we go. All right. I'd like to start uh, by telling you a little bit what, about what I did in the United States government that I think will speak to the, some, of, some of the issues of integrity in government that concern you. I truly was honored to be a part of the Bush administration and particularly in my role as the lead enforcer of integrity in government. I also note that I had darker hair at the time. I often quoted President John Adams who said, good government is an empire of laws. If we follow a rule of law, law that is enacted for all to follow, then we have good government. But it is not self-executing. You have to have people who will stand up for these principles. We call them whistleblowers, people who speak truth to power, who tell public people or public officials what is wrong or that some process or election is not being conducted fairly, lawfully, or without corruption. Uh, in the prior slide, I think uh, we can go back one. Yes. That's me in the picture there taking the oath of office from Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who reminded me that we should, I should look at my oath frequently and remember that it is not to a man I'm swearing to uphold the law, but to God. I believe I kept that oath signed by him sitting in my office for my entire five-year term. I think they think I'm going to play some music.
Now, I would testify to foreign legislatures, such as the Canadian Parliament, about our laws that protect whistleblowers and how we are able to oversee public officials and prevent illegal behavior in elections, as was my charge of office. That's me in the picture signing a statement before some officials. I also testified before our Congress on new legislation or initiatives, or when senators such as Senator Kennedy pictured there had hearings on the plight of returning soldiers who were being discriminated against. I also received diplomatic delegations from Southeast Asian countries and European countries on how to handle whistleblowers and how to promote greater transparency and have less corruption in government. You see, there was and still is a hunger in most countries to have laws that protect individual, and individual rights and groups from any retaliation or corrupt behavior for bringing out the truth. That is a key principle of the American system of government. We got a lot of publicity when I was in office for reducing our bureaucratic backlog. If you have a system of complaints from whistleblowers about nuclear sites or terrorism or illegal behavior of high officials, you have to ha also have the ability to get to those case cases and be efficient and aggressive. And my office had a 10-year history of being mired in backlogs and nobody being able to get any justice. So we tackled the backlog and we set up a unit to study new methods of cutting down time for complaints and cases, processing them and getting at a thousand cases that had never been looked at even, some for five years or more. And it turned out that we found many good things in there, things that had been overlooked, breaches of security at nuclear labs, homeland security problems, retaliation against public employees for reporting fraud or waste or abuse of power. We reported to Congress and the Vice President about these issues, and the outcome was increased productivity. And results. We took on new enforcement powers and duties without any new resources or money to protect our military, who were being discriminated against after returning from Iraq or Afghanistan, who wanted their jobs back as the law required. But even federal agencies, including the Department of Labor and the Department of Defense, who were charged with protecting military members and jobs, were violating the law. Enforcing the law like this did not make me very popular with people inside my agency who had to take on a lot more work or with forces inside my own administration or with certain special interest groups. But the Congress looked at how we achieved our results and after careful scrutiny recognized that we were doing important work and congratulated us for a job well done. We did not stop at bringing integrity to our own office. We sought to do that throughout the government and bring attention to it publicly. We did that through use of my office's powers to bring investigations against officials, direct officers of the government to cease engaging in illegal activities, issue subpoenas, including to White House officials. We went after reports of fraud, waste, or conditions that endangered the public. We succeeded in revealing a cover-up of operational errors that caused planes to fly dangerously close together. We were trying to avoid them. That's not what you want when you're flying in a plane. Because of my successes there, we received further reports of a cover-up of failure to properly maintain aircraft that had cracks in the fuselage of many of the aircraft. This led to the grounding of a thousand aircraft. My work actually made a lot of Americans have to sleep in airports. So in addition to making the FAA, Department of Transportation, and the White House angry with me, I had thousands of stranded Americans angry with me. We also went after abuse of power wherever it led, and it often led to powerful people. We caused the head of a powerful agency that handles all the federal buildings worldwide to have to leave office and a U.S. attorney had to leave due to our investigations amid the scandal involving Karl Rove and the firing of the U.S. attorneys. Because of what we uncovered, I requested an emergency funding from Congress, an additional $1.2 million to convene a special task force to investigate the possible widespread use, misuse of government power and Air Force One, and the use of official titles to coerce political activity 
and illegally try to get individuals elected during government hours and using government authority and money. It went on for several years, but at the conclusion there were findings that caused the White House to abolish the Office of Political Affairs. There was backlash, and I was investigated by those who were being affected over seven times by different entities. You see, even in America, when people have power, it is very hard to prevent them from abusing it, even if you're supposed to be investigating them. So we have our own political problems in America with tensions in the executive branch and between Congress and the President, or between the courts and the President or Congress. We live in a constant state of tension created by our Constitution, what we call our checks and balances. The founding of America comes from the rights as Englishmen enjoyed, as Neil was explaining, in the Constitution of England, from Magna Carta to the English Bill of Rights. These were checks and balances on the king's power and assurances of the natural rights or liberties of all Englishmen. The founding of my country was premised on the law of nature and of nations recognizing the inherent liberty of each individual and organizing the law and structure of our nation and constitution in such a way as to preserve that liberty for the individual as well as secure the protections of it for all peoples who may come to be a part of our nation and for all citizens who followed our founding. The Declaration of Independence is part of what is known in the U.S. as our organic law. Now, in our system, we have a preference for the separation or division of powers. It's an important principle to, to, to our country to have what we call divided government, which recognizes in human beings the ever-present capacity to form factions or different groups that oppose each other, like fierce positively and negatively charged particles that must circle the nucleus of the national life and be drawn into order by the centrifugal unifying principle of order and countervailing forces to make sense of it all. That's some pretty powerful countervailing forces there. Madison devotes a lot of attention to the power of the legislative branch to check the power of the executive, favoring the moderating influence of the Congress over the President and even the courts. The founders of America viewed executive power with some suspicion, afraid of another monarchy, and Madison did not want a tyranny of judicial power. So the American system favors the Congress as the people's branch. One of the great and enduring gifts from the Founders' generation was the inclusion of separation of power principles in the United States Constitution. You see the provisions there. The framers had studied the writings of Montesquieu and other political philosophers, as well as the workings of the separate branches of their own state governments. Their conscious design to enforce the separation of functions was carefully explained in the Federalist Papers and during the debates over ratification of the United States Constitution. The separation of powers is now enshrined in both the structure of the Constitution and various explicit provisions of Articles 1, 2, and 3, as set forth here. This chart shows the three branches of government, the separation of powers, and the proper exercise of powers. You see, the jobs are fairly well defined with Congress making laws, originating spending, and ratifying treaties, and the President vetoing bills or signing them into law and executing the laws or putting them into action, and the judiciary interpreting laws and the constitutionality of exercise of powers by the other branches. The President appoints judges for life but the Congress can impeach them, but almost never does. In practice, ever since the beginning of the country, and especially with the Judiciary Act and the administration of Thomas Jefferson, there has been a back and forth battle of various branches to take power from the other branches or fill vacuums of power that may occur from time to time. George Washington, our first president, in his farewell address to the American nation, said to the other countries of the world that they should have that the United States should avoid permanent alliances as necessary to making the executive branch subject to the passions of war. 
He made a treaty with Great Britain in 1795 that was considered quite controversial, but necessary to prevent additional wars and preserve liberty. Of course, in the intervening years since President Washington, we have had much executive action that has been brought into question. The gray areas are in executive interpretation of treaties or statutes or regulations. This chart shows that in recent years, there has been a lot of questioning of presidential execution of laws, executive orders, and the use of regulations to bypass the role of Congress. Recently, the United States Supreme Court struck down the President's appointment powers for the National Labor Relations Board during recesses of the Congress. So the checks and balances are alive and well in the American system. Sometimes these checks and balances cause a lot of what we call gridlock, with, a lot, with not a lot getting done in Congress. It sometimes can result in a total shutdown of the government, as happened in the United States recently. The law of nations is well recognized in the Constitution of the United States. It's found in the Federal Judiciary Act, 1789, which recognizes the law of nations in our legal and constitutional systems, basically, that is unchanged since that time. It is known as the jus gentium, or law of nations. The law of nations also is found in the Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 10. The Congress shall have power to define and punish offenses against the law of nations. It also says in section, Article 2, Section 3, that the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. This is known as the Take Care Clause. In addition to the Law of Nations, there are other sources one can look at for how the United States views questions of sovereignty and who has power within its own borders or territories. The Indian tribes or nations have a special relationship to the United States government, for example, and we have exercised a kind of trusteeship over them. Chief Justice Marshall wrote in the case of Worcester versus Georgia, a 1832 case, quote, Indian nations have always been considered as distinct, independent political communities, retaining their original natural rights. This is also found in the Northwest Ordinance of 1789, again, part of the organic law of the United States, showing a fiduciary or trustee relationship the U.S. has to prevent wrong to the Indian tribes. Yet it took 100 years to reach such a treaty and 50 years for the creation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA, in the Department of the Interior. The United States acts as a trustee of lands and mineral interests over Indian tribes through the BIA, but mismanagement and fraud have dogged this agency for the last 150 years. Other sources for the law of nations can be found in the customary norms of international law, including the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Hague Treaty, Alien Tort Claim Statute, and Anti-Torture Laws. Let's talk about Taiwan and the Law of Nations and the Law of War. We see here, depicted in this slide, the author Dante Alighieri and his tripartite scheme in the Divine Comedy of Hell, Purgatory, and Heaven. Purgatory, then, is that state between Heaven and Hell. Or in a political or personal sense, it is a place of being between, of limbo, of not knowing what your state really is. The title of this talk is Taiwan Civil Government, a Political Purgatory. This is not my invention, but comes from the words of a federal appeals court judge, Janice Rogers Brown, who said this in the ruling in the case of Roger Lynn et al. versus United States, which I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. Specifically, her words from the case are, quote, America and China's tumultuous relationship over the past 60 years has trapped the inhabitants of Taiwan in political purgatory. During this time, the people on Taiwan have lived without any uniformly recognized government. In practical terms, this means they have uncertain status in the world community, which infects the population's day-to-day -day lives. This pervasive ambiguity has driven appellants 
to try to concretely define their national identity and personal rights. And the history, a complicated one, is simply put a history of being recognized neither as a nation with a right of self-determination, but being allowed to operate as if it were an independent people while constantly being told contradictory things by other nations. Before delving into the case of Roger Lin versus the United States and the legal implications for Taiwan and the future, perhaps it is well we consider how things came to this pass. Remember when I mentioned earlier about the American founding and its recognition of the natural law and the law of nations? Well, this is an important issue in thinking about where you are as citizens of Taiwan. Let's consider some of the sources for the law of nations in our discussion. Professor Michael Ramsey of the University of San Diego Law School notes in his article, The Law of Nations as a Constitutional Obligation, one, that American leaders not only acknowledged the law of nations, but took its directions seriously. Two, the president remains the principal instrument of U.S. foreign policy including the formulation of U.S. foreign policy with respect to the law of nations. The Constitution imposes on the President the duty to take the law of nations seriously, but gives the President independent interpretive latitude in exercising that function. Sources for natural law can be considered to be the United States Constitution, treaties, international customs and norms, anti-terror laws and war crimes commissions in The Hague, and the UN Declaration on Human Rights, to name a few. By application of this principle, the argument goes, a distinction can be made between lawful and unlawful treaties or conventions and between customs which are innocent and reasonable and those which are unjust and deserving condemnation. From the time of the Portuguese explorer's arrival, in 1544 on the beautiful island, or Ila Formosa, as they called it, to the Chinese occupation under the various dynasties, to the Japanese occupation, then the Chinese occupation again after World War II, Taiwan has had a history that is troubled, but thankfully has resulted in some measure of independence. I will not try to do anything like a thorough history of your country, as I would not do it justice. But broadly speaking, as I understand it, some key events follow that will inform our discussion. Other sources that may come into play in our discussion are the Constitution of Japan, starting with the Constitution of Japan, Article 98-2, the treaties concluded by Japan and established laws of nations shall be faithfully observed. The legal relationship between Japan and Taiwan presents some interesting questions about the status of Taiwan as a sovereign nation or as a protectorate or trusteeship. For example, in Article 2, Items B and C of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed on April 17, 1895, between China and Japan, China cedes to Japan the island of Formosa, together with all islands appertaining or belonging to the island of Formosa and the Pescadores group. As a result, the Kuangsu Emperor of China, under the absolute monarchy, ceded the territories of Formosa and the Pescadores, now commonly known as Taiwan, to the Meiji Emperor of Japan under the constitutional monarchy. The government of Japan incorporated Taiwan, consisting of Formosa and the Pescadores, as an integral part of Japan by fully applying the Meiji Constitution to Taiwan through Showa Emperor's rescript of granting political rights to the inhabitants of Taiwan as Japanese subjects on April 1, 1945. This is also the day when the Battle of Okinawa began and might have been either ignored or neglected by the government of the United States since then. Consequently, it can be seen that the law of nations may be applicable to Taiwan due to the fact that Taiwan has been decolonized so as to constitute an integral part of Japan since April 1, 1945. During World War II, the Americans bombed Taiwan and effected the surrender of Japan through several years of entrenched warfare throughout the South Pacific, a war in which my own father served in the U.S. Army Air Corps, the 13th Air Force, from 1941 to 1945. By the way, he didn't do any bombing. He was on the ground. On October 25, 1945, the Republic of China, or ROC, 
troops representing the Allied command accepted the formal surrender of Japanese military forces. This ended 50 years of Japanese occupation of Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek led the ROC administration and announced that this day was to be remembered as Taiwan Restoration Day. Shortly afterward, the United Nations put China in control of the administration of Taiwan. The ROC left administration in place under the leadership of Chen Yi. Unfortunately, corruption and a number of other influences culminated in a loss of popular support for the ROC administration, leading to civil unrest and a major uprising on February 28, 1947. Because of this date, it is commonly known now as 228. The Chinese government sent over troops on March 7, 1947, and over a three-day period, anyone seen on the street was shot, homes were broken into, and occupants killed. The times following the 228 incident were terrible. Martial law was imposed from March 7, 1947, all the way until 1987. During this time, technically, nothing political could be talked about. No complaints could be made. People were unceremoniously and indiscriminately killed or beaten, and many had property or land expropriated. In late 1949, as a result of the Communist Revolution and a protracted civil war, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists, the KMT, were forced to flee the mainland. Because of obvious geographical advantages, the KMT chose to flee to Taiwan in order to reassemble and continue their battle with the Communists. For a wide variety of reasons, this continuation of the long civil war never materialized in a significant way. Chiang Kai-shek ruled Taiwan as president of the KMT from 1950 until his death in 1975, when his son Chiang ching wo ascended to the position. The Treaty of Peace of Japan was effected September 8, 1951, and went into force April 28, 1952. And after this, Japan and China entered into an agreement. In Article 2B of the San Francisco Peace Treaty, it states that Japan renounced all right, title, and claim to Formosa and the Pescadores. There was General Order No. 1 that called for surrender of all Japanese territories to the Allied Commander-in-Chief, General Douglas MacArthur. As a result, the government of Japan re renounced all right, title, and claim to Taiwan, founded on rights of sovereignty over Taiwan. During the years after the Peace Treaty of San Francisco, a period enters of relations between the U.S. and Taiwan, with treaties and agreements, interventions followed by U.S. actions, uh, by China, by, followed by actions by China and the United States backing away from Taiwan. With the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, President Eisenhower agrees to protect Taiwan against possible attack from mainland China and sends the Seventh Fleet to patrol the waters between Thailand and China. On September 3, 1954, mainland China punctuates its promise to liberate Taiwan. On, on December 2, 1954, sensing the possibility of a conflict in the waters between China and Taiwan, United States President Dwight Eisenhower signed a mutual defense treaty with the ROC promising protection from the U.S. for Taiwan. Now, in July of 1971, the U.S. formally announced its to China policy, supporting admission of the People's Republic of China into the UN while preserving Taiwan's membership in the General Assembly. This highlights America's shift towards improved relations with Communist China through the 1960s and early 1970s. On September 15, 1971, the U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger secretly visits China. On October 25, 1971, Taiwan is expelled from the United Nations. The seat is given to the People's Republic of China. In February of 1972, the U.S. President Richard Nixon makes an historic visit to China and issues the Shanghai Communique, an official statement further severing the country's diplomatic ties with the ROC. The actions of the U.S. and the U.N. caused a domino effect around the world with several major countries switching their diplomatic recognition from Taiwan's capital city, Taipei, to Beijing during the 1970s. On December 15, 1978, the United States announces it will terminate its diplomatic relations with Taiwan on January 1, 
1979. During this time from 1950 to the 1970s, martial law was in place on Taiwan. In 1987, martial law was lifted by the government and a series of political reforms were launched in order to expand the democratic, democratic process. Eventually, Taiwan held its first direct presidential election in 1996. In 2000, the presidential election ended five decades of government under the KMT and power was peacefully transferred from the nationalist KMT to the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP. Taiwan has thus established itself as a powerful working model for democracy. Current Taiwanese President Ma jing Zhu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Ma, was elected in 2008 from the KMT party. On February 28, 2004, in commemoration of the 228 incident, Taiwanese people formed a human line 500 kilometers long from the northern tip of Taiwan, Keelung, to its southern tip. This was done in effort to bring light to their oppression and to call for peace and to protest China. Taiwan has a competitive and dynamic free market economy which has brought all levels of society unprecedented prosperity. Taiwan joined the WTO, World Trade Organization, in 2002, thereby becoming an official partner in the world trading system. The government is now promoting industrial modernization and a knowledge-based economy. Meanwhile, in America, there were additional developments with the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. Over the last 30 years, this has been used to essentially declare unofficially official the relationship between Taiwan and the U.S. The act obligates the United States to sell weapons of a defensive character to Taiwan. It obligates us to be concerned about the situation in Taiwan and the region. And it obligates the President of the United States to consult with Congress about what to do. So, in a sense, we are obligated to be concerned and give Taiwan the means by which it can defend itself, but we are not obligated to come to the direct rescue. Finally, under Title 22, the Foreign Relations Act, there was an act granting the right to U.S. citizens born in Taiwan to place the word Taiwan on their passports as their place of birth, apparently recognizing the legitimacy of Taiwan as an independent country and giving rise to much consternation in China. This law in 1994 directed that Taiwan be recorded on request as the place of birth on passports of American citizens born in Taiwan. By 1994, the United States no longer recognized Taiwan as independent from China. The People's Republic of China was officially deemed to be the sole government of the area that included Taiwan. The government of the People's Republic of China, though, objected strenuously to designation of Taiwan on an American passport, and it refused to endorse visas on passports that recorded Taiwan as the passport holder's place of birth. There was, therefore, substantial basis for apprehension over the harmful consequences of an official policy that permitted Taiwan to be recorded as a place of birth on a passport. This brings us to Lynn versus United States. The litigation involving Roger Lynn et al. versus the United States was brought in 2008 and asserted that elections in Taiwan for, were illegal for the President of the Republic of China in the territory owned by the Emperor of Japan now being under de jure occupation by the United States and de facto occupation by the Chinese colonial regime under the name of the governing authorities on Taiwan as an agent of the United States military government. Permanent occupation by the Chinese colonial regime on Taiwan should be deemed as an offense against the law of nations, the lawsuit claimed. Plaintiffs sought declarations that, one, the AIT's refusal to process the individual's appellant's passport applications wrongfully deprived them of their status as U.S. nationals and the attendant rights that go with that, and two, appellants uh, the plaintiffs at the time, are U.S. nationals entitled to all associated rights, particularly those flowing from the First, Fifth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendments. The arguments presented in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, that's Washington, D.C., before the Honorary Rosemary Collier were as follows. None of the allies recognize any transfer of the sovereignty of Taiwan to the Republic of China 
upon the October 25, 1945 surrender of Japanese troops in Taipei. In the U.S. Senate ratified San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1952, Taiwan was not awarded to China, and the Treaty of Taipei confirmed these arrangements. From an examination of the military history of the Spanish-American War sessions of Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, and Cuba, it was clear, they argued, that the military government of the principal occupying power does not end with the coming into force of a peace treaty, but continues until legally supplanted. Plaintiff argued that prior drafts of the SFPT of Article 2B show that the Allied powers originally intended to give China sovereignty over Taiwan, then called Formosa, but later affirmatively changed their intention. The draft stated August 5, 1947 and January 8, 1948 provided, quote, Japan hereby cedes to China in full sovereignty the island of Taiwan, or Formosa, and adjacent minor islands, end quote. By contrast, the final draft of the SFPT did not transfer full sovereignty in Taiwan and the Pescadores Islands from Japan to China. In consideration of the, of the above, the plaintiffs argued, Taiwan has been occupied territory since the completion of the surrender ceremonies on October 25, 1945, and remains an occupied territory in the current era. The plaintiffs allege that this state of affairs has never changed. The United States remains the principal occupying power, holding sovereignty over Taiwan and title to its territory in trust for the benefit of the Taiwanese people. The lawsuit also argued that under the law of nations, Japan's sovereignty over Taiwan carries with it natural, inalienable obligations of sovereignty over Taiwan, and that accordingly, the Emperor of Japan still keeps the ownership of the territory of Taiwan, and the government of Japan still retains residual sovereignty over Taiwan. And this situation is in accordance with the doctrine offered by Mr. John Foster Dulles in a speech at the San Francisco Peace Conference held on September 5, 1952. The residual sovereignty which was applied to the relationship between Japan and the Ryukus, or Okinawa, during the period the trustee, uh, trusteeship system was exercised between April 28, 1952 and May 14, 1972. Recall again the trusteeship system set up by the U.S. over territories such as Puerto Rico, the Indian nations, and other territories of the U.S. The lawsuit argued naturalization of native inhabitants along the implementation of military conscription activities in occupied territories are in violation of the laws of war as recognized by the United States, in particular, the field manual describing the law of land warfare, FM 27-10, the law of land warfare. Under FM 2710, 359, Oath of Allegiance Forbidden, it is forbidden to compel the inhabitants of occupied territory to swear allegiance to the hostile power. Section 418, labor of protected persons. The occupying power may not compel protected persons to serve in its armed or auxiliary forces. No pressure or propaganda which aims at securing voluntary enlistment is permitted. The occupying power may not compel protected persons to work unless they are over 18 years of age and then only on work which is necessary either for the needs of the army of occupation or for the public utility services or for the feeding, sheltering, clothing, transportation, or health of the population of the occupied territory. Protected persons may not be compelled to undertake any work which would involve them in the obligation of taking part in military operations. The occupying power may not compel protected persons to employ forcible means to ensure the security of the installations where they are performing compulsory labor. In no case shall requisition of labor lead to a mobilization of workers in an organization of a military or semi-military character. Now, according to the plaintiffs in Lynn versus United States, the decision not to cede Formosa to China was a considered judgment. The final draft of the SFPT did not transfer full sovereignty in Taiwan and the Pescadores Islands from Japan to China. Instead, Article 23 designated the United States as the principal occupying power, with the government of the ROC as its agent. 
So what was the decision of the court? On March 18, 2008, the district court decision ruled against the plaintiffs, Dr. Roger Lynn et al., holding that only the president can decide questions of sovereignty, declaring that it is a political question, declaring that who is a sovereign of a foreign country or territory is non-justiciable, thus not within the competence of the judicial branch, and the separation of powers with two other branches, Congress and the presidents, being the only ones who weigh in on treaties and sovereignty. Thus, the issue of Taiwan's statute status involves too many policy issues consigned to coordinate branches, meaning the other branches of government, Congress and the President. On appeal, on April 7, 2009, Justice Janice Rogers Brown affirmed that holding against the plaintiffs, holding that plaintiffs have been put in a political purgatory. Quote, plaintiffs have essentially been persons without a state for almost 60 years. The last completely clear statement of authority over Taiwan came from General MacArthur in 1945. One can understand and sympathize with plaintiffs' desire to regularize their position in the world." End quote. The court went on to hold that it is a political question as to how Taiwan is regarded, whether as sovereign, an independent nation, or as part of the ROC or PRC, but not within the competency of the courts to decide. The decision that it was a political decision came from cases such as Jones versus United States and Baker versus Carr which held that who is a sovereign de jure or de facto of a territory is not a judicial but a political question. She found uh, that the president had not acted. Quote, once the executive determines Taiwan's sovereignty, executive being the president, we can decide appellant's resulting status and concomitant rights expeditiously. But for many years, indeed, as appellants admit, since the signing of the SFPT itself, the executive has gone out of its way to avoid making that determination, creating an information deficit for determining the status of the people on Taiwan. Now, other cases that have come down at, at about the same time seem to take a different approach to decision-making of the president. In Boumediene versus Bush, the United States Supreme Court observes that during open hostilities, it can consider and rule on issues involving Congress, the executive branch, and the United States Constitution in respect to the handling of alleged enemy aliens directly threatening the United States mainland. Now, if that is the case, the appellants argued in Lynn, surely the interpretation of the SFPT and its legal effects upon appellants under the U.S. laws are properly within the court's purview or ability to rule. But the opinion distinguished that case, which involved the ruling on legality of detentions at Guantanamo Bay, stating that the case did not overrule the political question doctrine, because in that case they were ruling on de facto sovereignty questions, whereas in Lynn it involved de jure sovereignty, that is, the very legal status of Taiwan, as opposed to how it was being treated in fact or in practice. The Lynn Court also distinguished other cases that might have provided support or ballast for the idea that the court could rule in favor of Taiwan. It distinguished cases involving the Philippines, finding that the Filipino population was entitled to the protection of the United States based on the United States sovereignty over the Philippines. Referring to Rabang versus Boyd, a 1957 Supreme Court case. Later, Congress acknowledged, quote, the final and complete withdrawal of American sovereignty over the Philippine Islands, end quote. The Lynn case was appealed to the United States Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court 
denied the case, refusing to grant a writ of certiorari, meaning it refused to take the case at all. It didn't say anything about it. So where does that leave us in the, in the law? What is the law since then? Well, some cases since the uh, Lynn versus United States do have some bearing on our subject today. Zivotofsky, XRL Zivotofsky versus Clinton, a, 19, a 2012 case, involved an act of Congress that required allowing a U.S. citizen to have Jerusalem listed as the place of birth on the, on the passport. The court explained that, quote, the federal courts are not being asked to supplant a foreign policy decision of the political branches. Instead, Zivotofsky requests that the courts enforce a specific statutory right. Because the lower courts erroneously concluded that the case presents a political question, they did not reach the merits of Zivotofsky's claim. The court found there is no exclusive commitment to the executive branch of the power to determine the constitutionality of a statute. The judicial branch appropriately exercises that authority, including in a case such as this where the question is whether Congress or the executive is aggrandizing its power at the expense of another branch. The question was, is the constitutional act, I'm sorry, the congressional act to require the immigration department to put Jerusalem on the passport, thus causing a lot of consternation among Palestinians and others who didn't agree with uh, Jerusalem being a, a Israeli uh, part of the Israeli state. Sorry, I can't separate the uh, pages here. And a lot of feathers got ruffled over the issue of sovereignty of Jerusalem. But does this interfere with the function of the president to make policy concerning Israel? That was the question. The court held that it did not and looked at precedents such as Morrison versus Olson, a 1988 case involving the power to discharge an, uh, a person in office under the president. The Lynn versus United States case is cited in the briefs before the Supreme Court in Zivotofsky, showing how important the Lynn case is now in the jurisprudence in this area. The government argued that the Constitution showed a preference for the president to exclusively deal with who is the sovereign. It said, the Constitution's declaration that the president shall, quote, receive ambassadors and other public ministers in Article 2, Section 3, constituted a special power of the president. According to the secretary, centuries-long executive branch practice, congressional acquiescence and decisions by the court confirm that the Receive Ambassadors Clause confers upon the executive the exclusive power of recognition. But the court rejected this, noting that the Taiwan passport law and other instances where Congress shared some of the powers regarding issues of foreign states, even when it could cause political hackles to be raised or implicate sensitive foreign policy issues. The court upheld the right of Zivotofsky to have Jerusalem put on his passport as his place of birth. But it sent the case back down to the lower court, same court that Roger Lynn went in front of, to determine the case consistent with the ruling of the court. We call that a remand in the law. Just to show you how crazy things get in our system as much as anywhere else, the DC Circuit Court, the court right below the US Supreme Court, which had decided Lynn versus United States, held the act unconstitutional the act that granted Zivotofsky the right to put Jerusalem on his passport, held it unconstitutional as intruding on the president's foreign affairs power. So it went back up to the Supreme Court and is now there to be decided this year. Uh, it's now called, of course, Zivotofsky versus Kerry because he became the Secretary of State after Clinton left. Now the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia invalidated the law as unconstitutional finding that Section 214 of the Foreign Powers Act that gave the right of one born in Israel to have that placed on his or her passport was an unconstitutional intrusion on the powers of the president. We'll see how this comes out in the coming term, but it seems likely that the court will reverse 
and find that Section 214 of the Foreign Powers Act does not violate the Constitution's separation of powers. Other case law involving the Alien Tort Statute, or ATS, a, 19, a 1789 statute giving non-U.S. citizens the right to file suits for international human rights violations in U.S. courts is uh, the Kiobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum Company case, a United States Supreme Court case from 2013. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a suit in U.S. District Court against Royal Dutch Petroleum for environmental problems in Nigeria that prompted a protest and a military crackdown on Nigerian citizens. The court held that the action of the law of nations for preventing human rights abuses such as occurred in Nigeria and the corporation that allegedly aided and abetted these abuses did not provide a cause of action in the U.S. courts where there is a presumption against extraterritorial application of U.S. laws. Citing the danger of unwarranted judicial interference in the conduct of foreign policy, the court said these cases should be allowed only with great caution. So even though norms of non-torture or other human rights abuses exist, this is not enough in and of itself to allow a claim in U.S. courts by a foreign national. What then are the lessons of Zivotofsky, Lynn versus the United States, and these other cases? While Lin held that since the president had not ruled on sovereignty of Taiwan, it implied that only the president is comp competent to act on that, Zivotofsky holds otherwise, finding that Congress has a role in the recognition of issues touching on sensitive political relationships, at least, when it concerns matters such as passports. Courts will be cautious in exercising jurisdiction unless there is a clear intent from Congress to allow the claim, as in Zivotofsky, but not in the Royal Dutch Petroleum case. What then is the way forward? When considering what to do in the future on the issues that are of such great concern here to you, I would say that a three-part approach is in order. Use of the legal system, action before Congress or with members of Congress, which we call lobbying, and then use of the media, print and or movies, documentaries, and that sort of thing. Using a three-dimensional approach gives a good chance of greater awareness and possible action. So the TCG strategy that we would recommend is continued attempts in the public interest litigation, which is most successful when it provides good human stories to tell about Taiwan. You've highlighted, you, uh, you've highlighted the amazing achievements of this country and its history, its challenges, its identity, and struggles as a people and as an influential island of the world. Combined with powerful legal arguments, TCG has at its disposal opportunities to continue to tell this powerful story of struggles and to uncover continuing injustices, whether it be in the area of human rights or elections or constitutional infirmities. These can be brought under the Taiwan Relations Act and the requirements of compliance with monitoring by the State Department over elections combined with the Alien Tort Statute utilizing customary international law standards. As we say in America, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come to your lovely country and to discuss this most important and interesting case of Lynn versus United States. As President Teddy Roosevelt said, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Thank you very much.